Hello there. My name is Joanna Trollope and I've been very proudly a patron of Chawton House since 2016. I'm also absolutely delighted to take part in this lockdown literary festival, which is a great tribute to the enterprise of the organisers and also it uh, reflects very well on the enormous popularity of Jane Austen's novels around the world. So a huge welcome to all of you globally who are fans of Jane Austen and wouldn't she be absolutely amazed and thrilled at her international popularity everywhere over 200 years after she was born. Now then, my novels. I try and write about the kind of situations that afflict all of us all the time throughout all our lives. I try and write that kind of reality because it's often much easier to um, confront a situation on the page. It's much easier to say, have you read a particular novel than to say, can we now talk about whatever the dilemma is and I think that's true it's certainly true of the English who are famously reticent but I think it's probably true of Americans too and so I try and always focus on something that is in the zeitgeist of modern life but people are very, very reluctant to talk about it. It is known in English anyway as the elephant in the room. You do anything rather than describe the elephant, to confront the elephant, to um, talk about the elephant, really, to, to grasp it. And so I, the novel that made my name, The Rector's Wife, that was really about the problem of being married to someone else's vocation in the days when it was expected that you subsumed yourself, particularly if you were a woman, a wife, you subsumed yourself into the greater glory of somebody else's vocation. And the rector's wife says to God, in fact, at some point, she said, I'm not another boat behind the rector. I am in my own boat. I am a real person. Please confront it. And I've done the same for all kinds of situations in um, various novels I've written over the years. And so, for example, that's The Rector's Wife. I've written about step families in other people's children. I've written about about the problems of adoption in brother and sister. I've written about um, working women in City of Friends. And now I'm tackling something that is very much an increasing problem nowadays. And it's known in England, I don't know if it is in America, as the sandwich generation, the problems of the sandwich generation, where they have parents who are beginning to be disabled and needy and disadvantaged at one end of their lives. But they've got very complicated teenage children the other end of their lives. But society, which often hasn't caught up with the way 
people are behaving or thinking at all, it still regards any kind of caring as women's work. But of course, it disregards the fact that most women these days are working and they haven't got time, even if they had the inclination. In fact, in some cases, the women are the breadwinners. I don't think it's at all uncommon now. I think about a quarter of the women in this country are now the breadwinners. And that's gone up from no percentage at all when I was growing up. So it's a, a vast difference. And I would say, as an old feminist, it's an improvement. Now, this book is called Mum and Dad, and it looks like this in the English hardback edition. And I'm going to read you something from it in order to give you a flavour of my writing and also a flavour of the characters in it. Now, if the situations are real, the characters have to be as real. So they might not be characters that you necessarily idolise. They're not idealised in any way. But I think there is, without question, the fact that you will recognise them. They are people in your own life. They are people you recognise as both lovable, but also, and frequently, absolutely exasperating. They just have to be accommodated to. And that is terribly important to me. I don't mind if you don't like a character, but I mind terribly if you don't think that they are real, that they could exist. I'm writing about reality, so the characters have to imitate that. They have to reflect it too. Now in this book, the main characters, or the, the older characters, the mum and dad of the characters, are Gus and Monica, who emigrated to Spain in the early 1990s. A lot of people, a lot of English people anyhow, emigrated to Spain then. The weather was much better the cost of living was about half and you could um, indulge yourself in a way that you could have all the freedom of life in a lovely climate there that you couldn't have quite so much in England. Now Gus and Monica started a vineyard in southern Spain in about 1992 and now they are beginning to disintegrate a bit. In fact the book opens with Gus having a stroke, a hideous thing to happen to anyone. But their three adult children who have six children between them, are all living and working in London and all their children are being educated in London, except for one. She's called Molly and she's only a baby. She's only about 18 months. She's got a nickname, which is Mouse. And so when Gus has his stroke, all the grown-up children have to go out to Spain to see him and to look after Monica and to try and assess the situation because he's been, Gus has been running the vineyard up to now. And this is a conversation between Katie, who's the only daughter, she's 
she's got an older brother, Sebastian, and a younger brother, Jake. And they're all in their late 30s, early 40s. And they have to go out to Spain. And this is Katie talking to her older brother, Sebastian, um, after they've seen Gus in the hospital. I've got friends, Katie said, who've been dealing with parent crises forever. Disabled parents, sick parents, demented parents, alcoholic parents, just generally hopeless parents. And I've sympathised with them. I've made all the right noises. I've done all the supportive things like have their children to stay. I've made casseroles. I've generally done my bit. But while I was doing it, I suppose I was thinking all the time that because mum and dad had made this very distinct and different decision to move to Spain, that they'd made themselves remote from all the usual responsibilities of family and that we were somehow free of the consequences of their choices. But we aren't, are we? This happens out of the blue and suddenly we're landed with our parents and they're kind of infantilized aren't they and they're looking to us like they were fledglings it's awful and i feel extra awful that i didn't see it coming that i pretty much chose not to see it coming i mean last night i wondered if i should go into mum's room to see if she was okay and i didn't I decided not to, because if I'm honest, I didn't want to. I didn't make myself. But Mum's seen Dad. She must know the score. She must know it's very unlikely he'll recover enough to be able to run the vineyard again. And that must scare her. I mean, what's the future for her? And for Dad? What's Dad thinking? It's beyond awful for them. It really is. Here they are in the ruins of what once looked like a bold and adventurous dream. One stroke and crash. The whole house of cards collapses. No wonder they're frightened. As frightened as we are. Now, what I'm trying to do in all these books is imagine that we are somehow we and the readers myself and the readers the writer and the readers are getting onto a train journey for part of the journey so the characters in the book are all on the train already and we join them on the journey for just part of the journey until they get to a point where there's some kind of resolution. They get to some sort of halfway point. And then we get off again and the characters go on. And it might be that this isn't the final solution. I don't really believe in happy endings. I mean, do you really? Of course you don't. They don't happen in real life, do they? And so why would they happen in a novel? And you, you can tell the sort of novels where the... Um, in fact, Jane Austen was an ex in a prime example of a novelist who was irritated once she'd got to the her, pe her protagonists, her engaged couple. She got them to the altar. And then she lost interest in them. I mean, if you if you look at the endings of almost all her six great novels, they are all impatient. You know, she's she's lost interest in them. The minute they're married, she can't really sort of bear it. Um, there's no point to them anymore. And I don't quite feel like that. 
I would rather leave you, the reader, with something to do at the end of a novel. I would like you to have some work to do. I, I don't, on the whole, write sequels. I have written some sequels of novels um, if they were romantic fiction, the Caroline Harvey novels. But on the whole, these modern novels, I don't really write happy endings for and I don't write sequels to them because that's for you to do. That's for you, the reader, to uh, take the story forward. So Mum and Dad is a classic case in point. I get the readers to... I get you all and the characters in the book up to a certain point and then I step back and you can take them on if you want to. Thank you so much. Bye bye.